<clears throat> while we load up, yes, perfect. Uh, while we load up, first off, thank you to Belinda, Peter, Noella, and, and uh, Christina, everyone else that I corresponded with to make uh, uh, to make it possible for me to be here today. I'm so excited to come and uh, discuss the Next Generation Engagement Awards. Uh, at this point, I'm, I'm really presenting something we've been working on, as Peter referred to. Uh, perspective from the NGO world, uh, programming that's in practice. So this is more of a snapshot and doesn't have, a, we're not at the point of a, a rich theoretical <coughs> framework or a situation within the literature, um, though I'm, I'm happy to book in Inez's talk uh, after a discussion of federal innovation. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, local level innovation. So um, as Peter discussed, uh, my, my name is Todd Boyle. I am uh, what you might think of as a freelance uh, public interest lobbyist and consultant with nonprofits in the United States. Uh, and I work with nonprofits on technology policy, communications policy. And uh, one of the hats I wear is working on uh, the ongoing digital rights discussion in the United States concerning things like network neutrality and. Uh, broadband privacy, and I'm happy to talk about those uh, over coffee later, but today I'm here to discuss Next Century Cities on our Next Generation Engagement Award. So uh, we're at a time of uh, a sort of a paradoxical time when on the one hand, uh, as Dave can tell you, citizens are doing a, a great deal of engaging democratically online. Uh, Twitter put out a press release just after the election. Uh, in November that more than a billion tweets were re sent related to campaigns, which is a, an eye-popping figure, at least it, it was to me. Uh, and uh, I can only imagine that uh, that number will, it, in four years we'll be thinking, what, only a billion tweets were sent in 2016? Uh, but, uh, I, or, or we'll be talking about some other technology platform, I don't know. Uh, and yet, public trust in government really is at historic lows, at least in the federal government. Um, so what we set out to do with the uh, Next Generation Engagement Awards is um, try and address, so if we were to draw a, a Venn diagram here, try and find the overlap and, and address the potential area of interaction between the two. Uh, so a word about Next Century Cities. We're a nonprofit association of mayors and local government leaders from across the United States. Uh, our smallest member, I believe, is Pikeville, Kentucky, uh, which is a population of about 400. The largest member would be Los Angeles. And uh, other major U.S. cities are members as well, Seattle, so on, uh, places you've heard of. We work very closely with New York, but uh, that's a city that can be a little bureaucratic, and it takes them a while to make decisions, and I'm already regretting saying that if this is going to be placed later. But I kid. I, I have a great esteem for the city of New York. It's just the other process. Um, and it's long been said that in the United States, the states are the laboratories of democracy. But for several years now, many of our states have really been in an area of, in a, a mode of retrenchment or austerity, particularly starting in January of 2011. So while we would have thought, if we were discussing this maybe in a previous decade, to see state level innovation. Increasingly, the states are, are sclerotic or, or unhelpful for the types of initiatives that we get so excited about. Instead, the cities really are the low side of innovation. Uh, and that brings us to the point that um, even a state government has gotten increasingly polarized, increasingly partisan. Uh, mayors are as solutions focused as ever. Uh, mayors are an incredibly nonpartisan bunch. Even when you know their partisan affiliation, even when they're, you know, even when they're elected as Republicans or Democrats, they tend to view uh, a pothole as a pothole. Um, schools need to. We, we want better education, and everyone seems to want better broadband. And so, Next Century Cities works to in sort of three pillars. One is technical assistance for mayors, and simply how do we help mayors form partnerships to get better broadband. Uh, sometimes that's working with incumbent telecommunications providers. As you may know, the American model of telecommunications provision is much more of a monopoly-based model, 
uh, as opposed to an open access model that's more common in, common in Europe. So competition takes a lot of effort and a lot of capital. We work with them to get there. Uh, sometimes that's pure technical assistance and helping them manage things like the rights of web. Um, sometimes it's helping them form innovative, out-of-the-box uh, partnerships that deliver high speeds of low costs uh, to as many people as possible. Uh, and we uh, launched, with some support from the foundation community, the Next Generation Engagement Award. So uh, I'll start at the second point. Our chief funding came from the Democracy Fund, which is a foundation in the United States, a relatively new foundation that makes does a significant amount of grant making. And I think it might be of particular interest to this audience. Uh, the Democracy Fund uh, was founded by Pierre Omidyar, one of the founders of eBay. So there's an interesting crossover, uh, an interesting dynamic of a technical approach, an agile development approach to grant making and uh, NGO engagement. Uh, that was the principal funding. Additional funding came from the Benton Foundation. And here, the Benton Foundation, for those who are familiar with the United States uh, public media, uh, Charles Benton uh, was involved in a lot of public media production and uh, was also involved in the sale of Encyclopedia Britannica. But the family fortune went to fund a foundation. Uh, and Charles Benton was a tremendous advocate for the positive role that communications can play in uh, transforming the lives of individuals and addressing inequity. So Charles Benton passed away, I think it would have been two years ago now. And so last year when we launched the Next Generation Engagement Awards, we named him in his honor. Also, his family foundation gave us a, a, a smaller grant, but a, an important grant nonetheless. Uh, we invited cities from across the United States to submit their best ideas on either A, civic, innovate, civic technology, or B, digital inclusion. And we left it as wide open and as purposefully vague as we could. Uh, we wanted to get away from the trap that so many uh, grant makers find themselves in of telling communities the problems they want solved, as opposed to allowing communities to tell us the, the issues that had the most re relevance to their community. So this is uh, what's known as the build for model. We received in our first grant cycle 19 submissions, which we were told for uh, the, the size grants we were giving out was a pretty good take for uh, a prize that had never been heard of. So uh, we received 19 submissions. We had five expert judges, um, and we picked three winners. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about each of them. Uh, I, they, they really run the gamut. And I, I'm actually pleased by, on the one hand, A, how unique each of them is, and B, how, you know, I mean, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'll, I'll say that for the end. So Raleigh, North Carolina, population 451,000, the capital of my home state of North Carolina. Uh, the area around it is uh, growing, it's dynamic, and it's uh, more than a million people in the greater Raleigh area. Uh, Raleigh is and has been booming. Uh, lots of people moving in, lots of te particularly tech sector development, lots of growth, and as a consequence, um, lots of uh, commercial and residential real estate development, lots of uh, changes to the city streetscape, lots of changes to the fabric of the community, uh, both in the people that are there and also in the way it even just looks as people are building and changing the community. So many communities have struggled, uh, well I won't say struggled, but have, have risen to the challenge, have engaged with the problem of how do we make development decisions more collaborative with the community. Um, some communities do charrettes, some communities do public hearings. What Envision Raleigh the goal of Envision Raleigh is to give members of the community a tool to visualize proposed changes to their community. So if a developer says we want to build a big tall skyscraper downtown, uh, Envision Raleigh actually allows members of the community to see how it would alter the city streetscape and how it would uh, potentially impact the sort of the feel of, of the community, uh, the sense of place.
Here is a quick video that shows Envision Rally at work. So this is round one of Envision Rally, and I, I mentioned that for a reason here. So this is downtown Raleigh. And in the demo, we're showing how different sized buildings would alter the streetscape. And if you notice, the developers also modeled uh, the shadows that each building would cast. And while some of these are sort of pretend examples, obviously no one's going to rotate a building 45 degrees uh, to put it in the middle of the street. Uh, it's a fruitful example to see uh, what they have in mind. So this was a town and gown partnership. The city of Raleigh proposed this idea because the members of the public had continually been saying, there's so much development going on, we barely recognize our city anymore. What can we do about it? Or people, and then the city staff would often say, well, we had a public hearing about this. You had an opportunity to come out and tell us that you didn't like the idea of that development. And then by that point, it's too late. So um, the city of Raleigh partnered with North Carolina State University, a research university uh, in town. That's known as a technical sort of engineering focused university. Uh, and a team of coders there developed the app. The city said this is what we wanted to do, and the student coders developed a basic version of the app. It attracted quite a lot of attention, and ESRI, the software development firm that creates GIS software, is anyone familiar with ESRI? Or familiar with GIS? Okay. Well, uh, ESRI actually flew. Uh, they were so impressed by the concept that they flew the entire team of student coders to their headquarters in Redlands, California, uh, and did an all-day hackathon to allow them to develop, to, and essentially an in-kind contribution to grow the program so it'll do much more. Version two of this, which is in development, will actually allow members of the public to interact and offer feedback on proposals. And so if you can imagine, if they were to, instead of looking at buildings, we were looking at parkland, uh, and we were looking at a layout of a potential park, uh, members of the public could actually say, no, 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 I, um, instead of a fountain here, I, I want you know, a, a dog park or something. But as, you, as if you can consider the level of engagement that this affords to the public to actually give clear feedback on the, the quality and the sense of space in their community, it's really quite a bit more than is available to most uh, most cities right now. So uh, a few words about Austin, Texas. Austin uh, it's a, it's the capital of Texas, and it's, it's a sprawling city. Uh, it's a very interesting city. There's a rich cultural heritage there, uh, Mexican-American heritage. Uh, it's also a music capital, lots of country music. Uh, but uh, Austinites often talk about the so-called three T's of Texas. Technology, traffic, and tacos. <laughs> and uh, it, they, they do value that, that rich Mexican-American cultural history, but there is also a very real, uh, because of its size and, and sprawling nature, um, there's a lot of traffic. Uh, and a lot of that traffic is because so many startups have moved in and brought people in, uh, and the population is booming. So there's a, a growth management challenge. But there's also, as with any kind of rapid development like that, an issue of housing affordability. And there's an, uh, a gentrification debate in Austin. So uh, Austin has been a very interesting place in terms of political dynamics. It's a very progressive city and a very conservative state. Uh, and the meanwhile, um, the city has really folk tried to find ways to address uh, inequality and uh, support the folks who might be otherwise left behind by gentrification. To that end, uh, in this picture I'm surrounded by people uh, who are either staff at or affiliated with Austin Pathways, a local nonprofit. And I'm standing also by a couple of the digital ambassadors that I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, 
Austin Pathways is affiliated with the city, the Housing Authority of the City of Austin, HACA, and or HACA. And HACA works with the people who are, who are one step above homelessness, as they say. Uh, they have public housing, but they also provide support to the social work uh, perspective. So HACA and Austin Pathways applied to create a digital ambassadors program to try and address a couple of these swirling Austin issues at once, including the lack of mobility for low-income residents. So uh, they proposed to do a skills training and a train the, with a train-the-trainer model, train low-income housing residents on how to use basic applications online to better understand their uh, transportation options and also how to get access to any e-government services that might be available to them as low-income residents, whatever they might qualify for. Now, it sounds simple enough, they want to be both digital and mobility ambassadors, uh, but it really took on a life of its own, uh, and I will show you here. So, this is Jan Morgan, uh, who was uh, one of the first digital ambassadors at Austin Pathways. Uh, Jan has been a resident of the Housing Authority Public Housing for quite some time, and she found that by engaging with the program, learning to use the applications, teaching other people in her community, she developed a real sense of uh, her own civic competence that was lacking before. She didn't realize the voice she had and the power she had. And she said to one of the directors, you know, it would be great if they moved to the bus stop. Everyone that I talked to said the bus stop is, is not functional. It's on the wrong side of the street. It makes it hard for people to, to get around. And she said, well, you know, why don't you just come to City Hall and talk to the transportation department about that. And Jan Morgan said, well, nobody's ever invited me to City Hall. And uh, the funny thing happened, and this is um, that uh, as this program developed uh, and as more of the digital ambassadors got on board with their digital skills training and then training other people and, and uh, a number of corporate sponsors came forward. So Car2Go, which is owned by um, Daimler, I believe, uh, and is based in Austin, gave a significant amount of money to the Austin Pathways so that they could broaden the program and train more digital ambassadors. Well, uh, Car2Go actually started placing their staff. They said, well, we want you to be trained by a digital ambassador. And they said, show me, yeah, Car2Go is a, a mobility company. They can't rent cars. They said, uh, they told their staff, tag along with someone like Jan Morgan or one of the other digital ambassadors and spend a day with them, shadowing them, finding to see what it's like to live dependent on the Austin bus network, which is, you know, this level of service is much lower than we would be accustomed to here in, um, in Austria, but it, it runs much less frequently and uh, the time cost that's committed, that is required of the residents is significant. So I think the, the opportunity for mutual learning was pretty profound. The third case that I'll share with you is Louisville, Kentucky. I saved this one for last for a reason. Uh, is anyone familiar with Louisville? City of Horses, Kentucky Derby. <laughs> The baseball bats come from uh, Louisville, and uh, there's a nice Muhammad Ali museum there. So uh, I, uh, I recommend it. Uh, Louisville is also known for its bourbon. Um, so uh, Louisville has a, a very interesting story to tell. It's a beautiful city. There's a great cultural history there as well. Uh, but one of the, the challenges that the city has faced is in promoting economic and community development in the Russell neighborhood. Uh, Russell is, uh, as historically, uh, much more African American and much lower income than the rest of the city. And uh, the city said, we, they proposed a gigabit experience center. They said, we want to create a space in town that will have ultra high speed connectivity, allow digital skills training, and at the same time be a startup space to bring together both high end savvy users and people that are getting online for the first time and just using the internet, beginning with some very basic, you know, left mouse button does this, so on, all the way up to the, maybe the next great app that's gonna revolutionize uh, our community. 
Um, so they proposed uh, the Gigabit Experience Center, and our budget was very small. We gave them about $30,000. Uh, but credit to the city of Louisville for marketing this and they said no we think if you give us a grant we can get a local match and we can get some more money. So then the PNC is a, a major bank in that part of the country. PNC said well our, found, our corporate foundation will match that in a little more and they went significantly more and then the city county government in Louisville, uh, Louisville Lafayette is consolidated so the metro government then matched that as well. Well the reason I mention all of this is what was going to be a simple digital inclusion center with some training, with some creator space. They were able to put all of that together with a couple of other initiatives that the city was undertaking to create a massive grant proposal to the U.S. federal government. Louisville then won a U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development grant for $29.5 million. So we gave them $30,000 and they helped, that helped them turn it into $30 million, uh, which in terms of return on investment is quite profound. Uh, I can't obviously take credit for all of that because uh, we were only one piece of it, but uh, we worked with them to help design the programming uh, and make sure that it was a cross-cutting uh, curriculum that helped not just the folks that were already online that wanted to start startups, but also folks that had never been online. Uh, you can see this is, I wish I had a better picture, but you can see this is uh, from last week's launch. This just, uh, they just had their, their ribbon cutting last week in Louisville. Uh, they, there's a historical exhibit here on the, that tells the story of Louisville. There's a nice coffee shop in there, uh, but there's also a digital skills space and there's also a maker space. Uh, and again, this is in one of the, one part of town that has historically really struggled to attract investment and, and sustain, have a sustained successful community development strategy uh, for a number of factors and far beyond the scope of this conversation today. But I think that this is a really telling example of how NGOs can work with local governments to leverage support from uh, non-profit grant makers as well as corporate grant makers and they leverage that against federal support uh, and turn small dollars into much bigger dollars. So the real question, as I've, I've done all of these, is what, what are the lessons, what are the takeaways for either grant makers or local government actors or NGOs? And uh, we've had a few sort of emerging learnings, though I, I almost hesitate to use the term because this is, as I said, so early. This is a snapshot that, again, that we gave them money the last year to help get this started, but they only uh, had ribbon cutting last week. There's a major opportunity for foundations to support local government innovation. This is something they've been doing for a long time, but I think they haven't always been as community focused as they could be. They haven't always emphasized building with and allowing communities to name the issues that they want addressed. I think the real success of the Next Generation Engagement Awards so far is that each community generated substantial outside support. Raleigh brought in the in-kind support from Esri when they flew everyone out to California and did a day-long hackathon with their team of coders. Uh, the value of that was in the tens if not tens of thousands of dollars, if not in the six figures, in terms of actual in-kind support from professional development staff. Uh, Austin, of course, brought in significant money from uh, car to go and from other corporate sponsors. That triggered uh, matching money from another grant uh, that they got elsewhere, allowing them to grow their support. And then third, of course, uh, Louisville was able to generate uh, both philanthropic dollars along with corporate support and then significant federal support. Uh, I think one thing that we should always ask ourselves about when dealing with corporate sponsorship is the issue of co-optation. I think that uh, anytime that, uh, you know, you, you always have to ask about what strings might come attached. And I don't say that to editorialize about any of these three projects. I don't think any of them had strings attached from the corporate support they got. but. Uh, as practitioners, I would encourage any of you who are practitioners or any of you who do work with practitioners to be thinking about what corporate support might mean in terms of agenda. Um, 
But uh, I think that, and, and my hope is that the Benton Next Generation Engagement Awards will get additional funding so that another round of communities can be funded. I think the exciting thing about each of these is just how much uh, press attention they've gotten locally and how much uh, mayors tend to copy each other. So my, my real hope is that uh, good press in Louisville will lead to good programming in Cincinnati nearby, or that uh, good programming in Raleigh will lead to good uh, programming in Charlotte, and so on. Uh, this is, a, or even Durham right next door. Um, though, uh, I think when we're looking at a, a political situation in the United States where the federal government is unlikely to appropriate substantial new dollars for civic inclusion uh, or civic technology, that uh, we do have to look at philanthropic and corporate sponsorships to fund the innovation that can be so good, that can be so impactful and can trickle up and trickle out. Um, and so while there may be uh, some uh, normative issues associated with those, with the funding sources, uh, at least in the U.S. context, this may be one of our best uh, avenues to generating the kind of civic innovation that can be so transformative. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I appreciate the opportunity to share a snapshot with, of the Next Generation Engagement Awards with you, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you might have.